What's up, folks, and welcome to another episode of the Keeping Carlson Short Shifts podcast. I am your host, Ben Burnett. Joining me, as always, Louis Ezekiel, and the E is for enormous leads evaporating tonight. Louis, I came into the night with a 30-point lead in Kakupful. As we start recording, that lead is down to three points. I am not having a good night. How about yourself? Uh, I'm, I've been trying to fight from behind all week, so I remain a little bit behind by about eight points and scheduled to lose by about ten, according to that Yahoo projector. So we'll see how it goes. I'm a little nervous, uh, but I'm hoping I can pull back in. It has not been quite on par with, uh, your struggles because I know you are up against, uh, a couple of goalies who are pitching shutouts as we speak. Hopefully we can jinx those out of existence with our little intro here tonight. That's right. Uh, right now we're looking at a Mackenzie Blackwood and Alex Stalock shutouts, which I hate, and I hope that we have jinxed them, although I'm feeling very, very unlucky tonight. Well, let's, um, let's just say that they're sure to finish those shutouts off, uh, and then everyone <laughs> listening tomorrow will uh, know what the results actually were and know how we jinxed them. There you go. Lewis, we're going to start tonight just like we started the other night in Toronto, but we're talking about an injury to Frederick Anderson. He left the game uh, Tuesday night, or it must have been Monday night, but we were talking about it on Tuesday. The concern at that point was a concussion, which has now been ruled out. He is still doubtful for Friday night, but worked extensively during practice. In the meantime, though, the New York Rangers really took it to back up Michael Hutchinson, and immediately after the game, the Maple Leafs hit the goalie market, and not with the goaltender who was in the same city as them. They did not pick up Alexander Georgiev, as was highly speculated. Instead, they called up the Los Angeles Kings and added Jack Campbell. I'm not sure to what extent this matters, right? We have Frederick Anderson presumed back in the near-ish term, though no firm date on that. Do you have any thoughts on the Toronto Maple Leafs goaltending situation moving forward? Yeah, so first off, I'm a little surprised that the Rangers didn't move a little bit more aggressively to make this deal. I think that fantasy owners of Rangers goalie stocks are just chomping down tums at the thought of potentially facing the rest of the season trying to sort out a three-headed goalie monster. That seems like not a lot of fun, not my favorite thing to uh, try to keep uh, up with in terms of those goalie races. As far as Campbell goes, I'm not super into Campbell outside of a few situations, uh, and I've got a couple reasons for it, not even including his abrupt decommitment from the Michigan hockey team in 2009. I'm trying hard not to hold that against him, although I am bringing it up uh, more than 10 years later, so I guess I'm not doing such a great job. Um, before I jump into kind of dealing with some of his stats, I do want to say... Obviously, a major caveat is that defensive problems on the Leafs are shared by both the goalies and the team defense and systems. Uh, I know there's Twitter factions that insist it's got to be either one or the other, but I'm going to try my best to take a measured approach and not claim that, you know, it's entirely on the defense, nor is it entirely on the goalies that Campbell might be working to replace. Uh, But as I look at them, uh, Campbell is 38th out of 53 goalies who have played 750 or more minutes this season in goals saved above average at minus 4.33. So the idea is an average goalie would have stopped about four and a third more goals than Campbell would have so far this year. Uh, And that's only in 20 games. So, you know, that's a pretty rapid way to build up that um, negative goal saved above average. The only player with a worst GSAA in fewer games is Anders Nilsson. Uh, granted, Anderson has been underwater and goal saved above average this season and has still been an asset in fantasy, so we know that this is not the end-all and be-all. Campbell's also going from the team with the 11th best expected goals against to the team with the 26th best, or if you prefer, the 6th worst. Um, and that also tracks with their high danger chances numbers that they're giving up. They actually have the same rank uh, 11th best and 6th worth with regard to the number of high danger chances that they give up. And those high number, uh, those high danger chances kind of worry me, um, because again, among goalies with 650 or more minutes, he ranks only ahead of Ranta, Smith, Nilsson, Howard, and Dubnik in high danger save percentage. Uh, and, you know, I think that bef- behind those, and I think that Potentially behind a more porous defense, 
uh, that could present a bit of a problem. The main issue that I have with a lot of getting too down on Jack Campbell before we see him perform in Toronto is a lot to do with the the mantra that we have uh, throughout the Keeping Carlson Network, the all goalies are bad slogan. What that really means, like when you get down into the essence of it, is that no goalies are predictable. That's kind of what we're really getting at here. And so what we've seen over the past few years is that previous performance does not appear to always dictate future performance. When it comes to goalie performances, and, you know, we're looking at so many different factors, we're looking at team performance, we're looking at defensive performance, we're looking at shots against, we're looking at where those shots come from, we're looking at how a goalie plays, and there's so much that goes into that mentally, and I really don't want to stress that the statistics don't matter, because obviously the statistics are important, and they do tell a story of what has happened, but what we've learned with goaltenders is it can be kind of presumptuous to assume that just because they've done well on a specific sample size that they've done that they will do poorly moving forward so for example jack campbell pretty decent last year suddenly not so good this year though the la kings have been arguably a better defensive team to me i think if you get a chance to get a goaltender on a team who's been as good as toronto has been for wins over the past few months not only wins if you look at toronto's expected goals stats just since sheldon keith took over they're roughly league average as far as the goals expected to be given up so i just don't know that i'm ready to look at campbell's numbers to date and assume that that means that he's a bad goalie and that he won't perform well in Toronto. I think if you're desperate for a goalie or if you just need a few starts in the short term, that Campbell presents an interesting opportunity because he's on a strong team and because we've seen him be okay in the past. He has not had enough experience in the NHL to really write him off to any significant degree, in my opinion. So I just, I'm more so think that this is the sort of buy on a goalie that you can get away with because it's going to be cheap and the upside is pretty solid. Yeah, you know, um, I think that there certainly is some value here. Uh, Obviously, I believe that Jack Campbell today has more value than Jack Campbell yesterday uh, with the opportunity to put together a run of starts here potentially, although the fact that Anderson was only listed as doubtful for Friday and had some pretty extensive work, I think that uh, his time as kind of a fill-in starter for an injured Anderson may be short-lived, but we'll see. Like we said last episode, uh, neck movement, probably pretty key factor for a goalie. So uh, one other thing that I wanted to look at as I was examining their stats was, um, you know, I thought at least as he's moving from LA to Toronto, he would be on a team with better possession metrics. So that might insulate him uh, a little bit from some of the dangerous chances against him but actually toronto ranks two slots behind la believe it or not these are two top five Corsi four percentage teams so they are getting the larger share of shot attempts uh while they are out there on the ice so that's obviously a, a fine thing i don't think the drop from three to five is anything that is worth noting um but I I was a little surprised to see that L.A. was so far up there. Of course, L.A. has been shooting a ton and getting very little for it. Um, So, you know, uh, take that for what it's worth. Basically, my conclusion is is similar to yours. Uh, I, I'm I, we actually are agreeing a little more than I think it's coming off because I think that he you know is in an improved situation and he has the chance to get some short term starts and potential wins while Anderson is injured. I I worry a little bit about his rates. Obviously, we'll find out in pretty short order uh, what we're looking at in terms of how successful he's able to be. Um, but yeah, if you're in a league where rates are important or like in Kakupful where your scoring is based on saves made minus goals against, uh, I, I wonder about how much value he's really going to be able to offer. I, I don't know about your division, but I know in my division, the Kakupful, for instance, uh, Campbell was not picked up this morning and I thought maybe someone would spend some of that fab money on him. How about in, how about in yours? No, nobody picked him up, I don't think, in either of the Tier 2 divisions or the Tier 1 division. I wonder to what extent that is because the news of the trade came somewhat late in the evening. Um, But the other thing for me that I think is interesting to bear in mind when it comes to Toronto moving forward is that a lot of the, a lot of the general managers and teams that are somewhat forward thinking when it comes to goaltending deployment have really leaned into the whole 
two-headed monster in net. I think that Kyle Dubas as and Sheldon Keefe, two guys who have shown that they're willing to be forward thinking about usage, are probably two guys who would love to be able to supplement Anderson's workload and keep him more fresh for a first round matchup in the Atlantic. So my guess would be that they would love to give a goaltender a shot, even if Anderson is healthy. I don't think that he would supplant Anderson by any stretch, but we could be seeing, you know, a 60, 40, a 60, 40 split. If Campbell is up to hanging at a reasonable safe percentage. Yeah. Or maybe even just kind of a one out of every three games. But I think that is a really good observation. We've certainly seen the goaltending for the Leafs suffer in the early stages of some of these playoff series. And yeah, I think trying to not repeat the mistakes of the past is probably pretty high in the minds of the GM and coach. Well, not only have they been weak in the early rounds of the playoffs, but they've also been pretty weak this year. Like, Freddie has not been his usual sterling self, so I'm sure that they would be more than happy to give him all the time he needs to get back, especially if Campbell can have a solid start to his days as a Maple Leaf. Let's move on to another injury in a Canadian city. We're talking about Mark Giordano in Calgary. He left the game earlier this week, and it looked a little serious. There were a lot of concerns about his knee. What they announced today was that it is a lower body injury. It is not as serious as originally thought. No surgery required, but he will be reevaluated in a week. So Mark Giordano, week to week, who do we think steps into his spot on the top power play and therefore has a nice little bump in potential value? Yeah, we'll we'll certainly find out tonight. I do see a couple spots where, sorry, this is Thursday night. I do see a couple spots where Rasmus Anderson is projected to be on that first power play unit. Um, so that could definitely be interesting. It could be Noah Hannafin as well. If we're still recording at the time that they do warm-ups, we might be able to give you a better update than that. But you'll be able to check on your own. You could look at game day lines on Twitter. Um, you know, I my feeling here is that this is sort of like the Logan Couture or Tom, Tomas Hurdle injuries, that basically it doesn't really help anyone uh, outside of the person who comes in to, to fill in and kind of hurts everybody else. You know, certainly an interesting opportunity for Rasmus Anderson if he gets up there. Uh, I'm sure there are many Flames fans, uh, my partner included, who would like to see uh, what he's got on that PP1 deployment. But at the same time, I think the the danger that it sort of hurts the Flames power play overall uh, is a more likely outcome. But it seems like Giordano may not be out for all that long compared to how it seemed like, at least when we initially saw him go down, and it seemed like it could be uh, much more extensive. Yeah, it's a bummer, too, Giordano having probably the hottest stretch we've seen from him this season after a pretty disappointing point production start to the year. We have seen Anderson on the top unit at least once this year for a stretch. He really hasn't done much, and the fact that he's not super productive on the back end makes him kind of disinterest, like uninteresting to me, similar to the way that Matt Grizzlick, when he gets up on that top unit in Boston, it's not really a huge event. So I might, I would be more interested in seeing Noah Hannafin up there with somebody who is able to produce peripherals, but we'll see tonight what the plan is in Calgary. Yeah, absolutely right. We've got one more Canadian injury to talk about. Uh, We had Shea Weber head to IR on Thursday morning. Uh, Looks like Weber had a lower body injury, possibly from a late blocked shot in the last game. Uh, Like last time, Weber was injured, and and unlike sort of the situation with Giordano, there is someone who's going to step into those top power play minutes who I think is quite interesting and capable of being quite productive in Jeff Petrie. Uh, pride of Ann Arbor, Michigan. He's been super useful even while Weber has been healthy, so it's unlikely you're going to be able to go out and grab him. But, you know, maybe you could swing a quick trade for him before anybody notices that he's filling in for Weber on that top power play. I'm not really sure. But certainly, um, you know, uh, you had a good observation about what that mean might may mean for the power play units. Well, Seeing Montreal split those top units the past few weeks and see what they have as a team who basically ices two equally dangerous power play units has been kind of a bummer for owners of individual members of the Habs. Tonight, what we've seen in the absence of Shea Weber is much more of the same. We're seeing a pretty even split, no number one for certain unit. The one member of the team who has seen an uptick in ice time is Ben Sherratt filling in for Weber on the power play. So maybe he's worth a stream in the short term. 
Yeah, that is interesting. I thought for sure we would have seen just that sort of overloaded top power play with Petrie. Uh, we had talked earlier today, and it seemed crazy that you would just put Sherratt in charge of his own power play unit as the QB, but it does in fact seem like that is what they are hell-bent on doing uh, up in Montreal. So I guess we will have to see how that turns out for them. They are in a deadlock right now with the Anaheim Ducks. And maybe that's a short-term thing. Maybe, you know, they find out about Weber being out this morning and they're just kind of like, well, we'll just run with what we have and not a lot of time to practice here, so we'll just throw Sherratt into Weber's spot. But maybe this, you know, this is something that Claude Julien has shown he's he's trying to do in Montreal for the past few months. So, you know, maybe this is what it is. And if so, Ben Sherratt, big upgrade in his fantasy value. One more injury in St. Louis. Vladimir Tarasenko skating with the Blues today. Would love to see him come back, though there is still no updated timeline on him. Uh, the original timeline for ish months would put him back in the March to April zone. And, you know, the longer, the closer we get to that date and the more we see him progressing through his injury, the more I'm starting to think that we could see him back in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, one to really keep an eye on there. I think that would be very exciting for the Schwartz and Steen line, where he's likely to regain that position. Uh, maybe not so exciting for Robert Thomas, who would likely then be bumped back down to the bottom six. Lewis, we have been taking our sweet time getting to it, but as always, on Thursday, we are going to go into the Patron 5 now. The Patron 5 is a five-player list voted on by the patrons of Keeping Carlson. You can become a patron of Keeping Carlson at keepingcarlson.com slash patron. Basically, Basically what we do each Thursday, we have patrons vote on players and they give us questions about these players. They want to know, you know, for example, what's going on with Matt Dumba? That's a name that we're going to hear tonight. And so we do a little bit of a deep dive. We get specific with a couple of players. I'm going to start with Dumba in Minnesota. Patron Greg asked, is Dumba finally turning it around? I researched this before Dumba's game tonight and so far in the five nothing or no the three one lead in Vancouver, Dumba has zero points. But in the five games leading into this, Dumba had five points, and folks were wondering, has he finally turned the corner? Personally, I'm not getting too excited. There are reasons to expect more of a bounce back from Dumba. His his even strength and power play IPP is very low. He's yet to score a power play goal on 30 shots, despite typically scoring around 10% of his power play opportunities. A couple months ago, I looked into Dumba for Dauber in my Geek of the Week column. At the time, I thought a 42-point pace seemed about right for him. Since then, in 19 games, he's paced for 39 points. So, feeling pretty good, giving myself a little pat on the back about pretty much being on line there. I don't think that this recent surge for Dumba is a case of being back. I think the early season slump was uncharacteristic, and this is him regressing to useful fantasy defenseman level. The pre-draft type level is not going to come back for him. He's just not producing enough shots, and when you look into last year's numbers, there were a lot of unsustainable features, not least of which that individual shooting percentage. Moving forward, I like Dumba as a 40-45 to 45 point player. Yeah, you know, Dumba really blew a lot of people away with his production last year. Uh, there were a lot of folks, myself included, who were really taking with him and hoping that perhaps we could see a future where this could be, you know, a, a 15 goal defenseman on the regular. Um, I think we have seen that, that maybe last year was in fact the outlier, but, you know, if he can start to make a bounce back, start to be productive, you know, that obviously is a good step in the right direction. I'm still kind of interested in keeping an eye on him down the road. You know, Ryan Suter is is getting older and that that uh power play spot seems to still potentially be within his grasp. Like there's some pretty heavy competition for it, but you know, why not Dumba with all these other folks? So if he can start to get that power play shooting percentage back together, uh, I start to become a little more interested in him. I think the issue with the power play in Minnesota is they seem pretty committed to the three forward, two defenseman role. And so, you know, you see Brad Hunt get power play time. You see Jared Spurgeon get power play time. They don't seem to me like a team who is anywhere near rolling four forwards, one defenseman on a, you know, 70% or 65% of the power play type team. They're also a team that lacks for a superstar. So are you ever, are we going to see a overloaded top power play with Matt Dumba at the forefront in Minnesota? I don't really see it. 
All right, well, let's jump on to the next member of our patron five. I also, something just interesting that I pulled up today, uh, I discovered that there is a U.S. Navy squadron called the Patron Five Mad Foxes of Jacksonville. Uh, if you are one of our many dozens of listeners and you are a member of the Mad Foxes, uh, please get in our DMs at AVG Time on Ice. We would love to talk to you uh, since we share a name in common. I want to spend some time talking about Kevin Hayes, Brandon Weeb, who is responsible for developing our lovely logo and all the cool new logos you're seeing across the Keeping Carlson podcast network, asks, can Kevin Hayes sustain his awesomeness? He's often stuck on the third line. He's really been an up and down guy for much of the season. A lot of streaks going on. Just if you look over his past few games, uh, he had five points in the last four games, not counting uh, Thursday night's game. He only managed four points in the 11 games before that, and then had seven in five before that. Uh, so we're looking at a 20-game set uh, where he has managed a nice 14 points, but they've been very much uh, separated by a long kind of gulf of lack of success and then bookended by some really successful spurts there. Um, as Brandon mentions in the question, Hayes has spent significant time on the third line, even with Nolan Patrick injured for most of the year. Uh, with Couturier and then Giroux coming in from the wing to take one of the center slots ahead of him. Thursday night, he played with Pitlick and Lawton, um, but he has spent more time with Konechny and Giroux over on the wing over the last 12 games, uh, which has led to some, some games with some very nice time on ice. Four of those 12 games, he's played over 19 minutes, uh, with Thursday's results still pending. He's also spent time on the top power play lately, with 50% or greater share of power play time in eight of his last 10 games. And this power play time is going to be a really important determining factor as to whether Hayes can keep up the awesome, uh, because power play scoring is featured in both of the hot streaks I've mentioned, while the slumps have corresponded with periods of sub-50% power play time on ice. I'm a little worried about his shot rates, which have slowed down lately. He's had two or fewer shots in his last six games games, uh, again Thursday not included, uh, even as he scored three goals in that time on seven total shots. Still, if he's holding power play one time in Philly, I'm into Hayes as a stream, but I'm definitely ready to ditch him for something better the moment he loses that power play deployment because he is relying on it for fantasy relevance. Yeah, I think the thing with Kevin Hayes is definitely that he's streaky, and when he's getting good deployment and putting up points, he's worth having in your roster, but there's no way that he's going to be that guy for 82 straight games, just like he wasn't in New York, so I think you hit it on the head with the streakiness, it's it's going to come in spurts, and so at that point, you're you're happy to hold him, but don't hold him too long. Yeah, I'm with you there. All right, we'll move on to the third player in our patron five this week, and this is a player who is... Asked about, of course, by our newest patron, Lewis, this is my dad, Gord. And my Gord. dad wants to, he's, he has made his first appearance on the show. Welcome to Short Shifts, Gord. Gord asks, what level of scoring should we expect from Gabriel Landeskog? A little personal anecdote here. I recently traded Gabriel Landeskog to my dad in a deal for... I recently traded Gabriel Landeskog in a deal to my dad in exchange for Brock Besser. We're both kind of hoping for better days ahead out of those two players right now. Uh, Landeskog, really disappointing year for him. He was a pick inside the top 30, I would say, in some banger leagues, and he's severely disappointed. After a year where he was above a point per game playing with McKinnon and Rantanen, at that point, they were getting hype as the best line in the league. That hype really hasn't been there the same way this year in a, in Definitely in part to slumps to both McKinnon and, or to Rantanen and Landeskog. They've also both been on the shelf, obviously, with injuries. Landeskog is a 50 point player so far this year through his first 36 games. Largely, he's still playing with that line. So I'm wondering what it could be that's causing such a slump. When I look under the hood, things do seem to mostly be in order. His shooting percentage is within range of the career average. His on-ice shooting percentage is fine. The main issue with Landeskog is that at 5-on-5, five five, he's getting points on only 40% of the goals scored while he's on the ice. That number is typically closer to like 75% for forwards. I'd expect at least a number north of like 60%. So when you look at Landeskog's last three years, you see he's fallen to just 54 and 62% of the goals when he's on the ice. 
I have a guess about this, and I don't have data to back this up, but my guess is this is the Ranton and McKinnon show, and Landeskog doesn't really touch the puck when they're trying to move it up the ice, because why would you give it to Landeskog when you could have Nathan McKinnon barreling through the neutral zone and then fire the puck or, you know, ease up and make a pass to a streaking Landeskog as he comes in? You know, those shot rates are still there. It's really just that you're not seeing him get a ton of assists on the ice. So... In my opinion, that lack of touching the puck is causing his assist totals to go down. I still expect positive regression from that 38% IPP right now, though. And it can't hurt to hold that deployment, right? Like, we're still seeing top line, top power play, all those minutes with McKinnon and Rantanen. You can't go wrong there. So I do see Landeskog turning it around, being a 70-point guy moving forward, and continuing to provide elite bangers floor. Yeah, 38% is way too low for a guy like Landeskog, but I think you're right. You know, the, the fact is that the offense does not travel through him in the way that it once did as McKinnon and Rantanen have really developed this chemistry in a way that was sort of McKinnon and Landeskog's setup uh, previously. So I think you've, you've got a good, you've got a good point that uh, we are going to see some of those assists start to come back, but maybe not to the level that you might have expected three or four years ago. Absolutely. Why don't you tell us you're the fourth player on our list, Lewis? All right. A very exciting and interesting player that has been just uh, flying off of waiver wires is Zach Sanford, who super patron Ryan M. has asked about. Sanford has been an intriguing ad the last couple weeks. Uh, he's been granted more minutes to build on his much improved points per 60 rates in the 2019-2020 season. Uh, and he's getting a lot of enviable deployment with that top... Uh, six line with Ryan O'Reilly and David Perron, uh, who have just been really quality offensively this season, uh, even as they are being tasked with facing up against some of the more challenging uh, opponents' lines. They're getting a lot of defensive zone starts. You know, their quality of competition is rather high, uh, and yet uh, they've been doing quite a bit of scoring. Um, I like Sanford also because we mentioned this before when we talked about Tarasenko, but uh, when Tarasenko, when and if Tarasenko returns, uh, he is likely to be lining up on that Shen Schwartz line, uh, which means that Sanford, as opposed to Robert Thomas, uh, is someone who I think, if he can continue to build on this chemistry, is going to hold on to a top six spot with Tarasenko's return, whereas Thomas is likely uh, doomed to drop down to bottom six deployment. Uh, and he's been really super productive uh, over this stretch. In the last nine games, he's outscored his total from the first 32 games, uh, 11 to 10, uh, to put him on a 42-point pace uh, for the season, despite a 27-point pace at the midway mark. Um, so this increase in scoring has come along with an extra 90 seconds or so of time on ice each night. Uh, and while he's been paired up, you know, with the same line for much of his time, it's been his most common set of line mates for each quarter of the year so far. We're now within the third quarter. Um, he's just getting more time out with those line mates, uh, and he's shooting much more. He's up to almost two shots a game from kind of the one point somethings that he was in earlier in the season. So look, a return to a more modest pace for Sanford should be discussed as an inevitability rather than a likelihood. Uh, first of all, he's got 15 total power play minutes all year. Uh, he has managed a single power play shot in that time. So uh, this is not a guy who is breaking into uh, the power play in any meaningful way. Uh, and that's usually needed to maintain a sort of run like this. Uh, he's also shooting 15% on the season. Uh, including five goals on 17 shots in this latest nine-game hot streak. So this is obviously not a sustainable set of production, um, but in the short term, I like him as an ad while he's seeing at least 15 minutes a game. Um, but if that time on ice drops back into the 12 to 13 range where he was before, or if he starts to cool off, like with Kevin Hayes, I am ready to drop him for a new shiny object if we start to see zeros on the score sheet. You know, I, I, I like Hayes because he's got that power play one deployment. I like Sanford because he's just been absolutely on fire. Uh, you know, I think they're kind of, they have different value for different GMs. It sort of depends on whether you're looking for a more modest but longer term solution or to take advantage of Sanford as a flash in the pan right now. 
Totally agree there. I don't see him as a season long hold. I think he's someone that you ride while he's hot and then you bail as soon as he's not. I could see, you know, with, with Kevin Hayes, I think that you're getting actually like elite deployment with that power play line one. Maybe not elite, but like high end deployment. Sanford doesn't even have that. He really just has the, the hot streak. So I don't see that continuing for much longer, but while it's here, hey, I have no problem rolling. Yeah, I've got a bunch of shares. I'm trying to ride the wave while I can, but like I said, I am ready to uh, drop him as soon as that next shiny object comes along and he starts to cool off. All right, we will get to the last player on the Patron 5, and this is a player, we're going full circle here. The first thing we talked about was the trade with LA and Toronto. Let's talk about the LA side of things here. Obviously, Jonathan Quick is the number one in LA still, but as a result of the trade, Cal Peterson has been called up, and the patrons of Keeping Carlson asked us to discuss Peterson's new value. Last year, Peterson was an excellent, excellent stream. He had a 931 save percentage in 11 games with the Kings. He started to turn heads, and then he got sent back down. I do remain skeptical about his numbers, especially in such a limited sample size. 11 games is really not enough to say, okay, this is the type of player he is. This is his true talent level. And in over 120 AHL games over the past three years, Campbell has struggled putting up a 910, 896, and 906 save percentages in each sequential season. I went into this thinking, though, there's no way that he's interesting. LA is awful, and there's no saving this team. But I've really kind of come around on him with a few caveats. So in, it makes sense that LA, a team who is top five by expected goals for percentage, would be underperforming when John Quick is in net. But it's also possible that this is a team overrated by that metric, right? Like we've seen teams be bad despite solid underlying metrics. So, you know, it's tough to say to look at this LA team and I've watched them this year. Like they're a very uninspiring team. It's tough to watch them and reconcile that ranking in the expected goals market. On the other hand, though, Peterson did put up great numbers last year and so did Jack Campbell. Campbell went on to really struggle this year. So why is that? Why has Peterson struggled so much with Ontario in the AHL despite having been good in the NHL? What if Jonathan Quick stay, stays getting all of these starts? LA is still committed to him. He's got three more years on his deal at six million per deal. That deal is close to unmovable. Nobody wants three years of way past his prime Jonathan Quick. And the last thing you want in your fantasy leagues heading into the playoffs is Los Angeles' backup. So I think the move here is to wait and watch. If he starts coming in and they show they're willing to give him a run, he starts to become interesting, especially if he already, you know, off the top is putting up last year's numbers. But I'm not adding him sight unseen. And if he puts up a stinker or two, I'm probably not holding on. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And yeah, Peterson does not inspire a ton of confidence for me. I am very gun shy about LA goalies at all. You know, it's it's one of those situations where you look at the advanced stats and you say, you know, where, where am I seeing these really play out in, in the game? And we've seen certainly that teams can defy some of these advanced metrics for significantly long periods of time. So, you know, despite the, and, and they have shortcomings too. You know, you have LA just blasting everything they can at the net, uh, in a way that earns them things like their core C4 percentage, but isn't necessarily helping them be successful in terms of winning games. Uh, and yeah, I think Campbell, like, if you're looking for backup goalies, there are many that are more interesting than, sorry, I said Campbell. There are many more interesting than Peterson who are out there and available for you right now. Yeah, I'll list Jack Campbell as one of them. Yeah, I would definitely, I would rather have Jack Campbell than have Cal Peterson. Uh, I would rather have many of these guys who are kind of in either a battle or in kind of a two headed monster situation. You know, there, there are so many more interesting options out there that also play for teams that are more likely to probably get a win on a given night. Yeah, he's kind of struggled recently, but I've seen anti-Ranta on a bunch of waiver wires. And honestly, given the uncertainty of the Kemper injury, that's a much nicer stash, in my opinion. Obviously, in deeper leagues, he's probably gone. But, you know, that's sort of a player, somebody who we are more certain that they're going to see some starts. That's who I'd be looking at before I got to the, the Cal Peterson tier. Yeah, nice. For sure. All right. Well, Lewis, we have gone all of the time that we have. For myself, Ben Burnett, I am out of here. Why don't you sign us off? 
All right. Well, as always, we want to thank Fantrax, Yahoo, Natural Stat Trick, Corsica Hockey for helping us research our episode. Thank you to all the patrons of Keeping Carlson for helping us make all of our wonderful shows that we bring to you each and every week. Uh, please check out Saturday Streaming with Ben to give you some sit-start advice. Follow us on social media. Uh, ben and I, along with our friend Jade, are at AVG Time on Ice. You can follow at Keeping Carlson. And of course, uh, Elon tweets out Game Day Lines with at Game Day Lines. Uh, all very useful tools for you. We love to answer your questions, interact with uh, patrons, and anybody who's out there in the Twitterverse. So if you would love to chat with us, we'd love to chat back with you. And the first piece of advice we will give you is to play smart and keep your shifts short.